Welcome back, ladies. It's been a couple weeks. And we are so blessed to have you back with us today in Mark chapter 11. So would you open your Bibles to Mark 11? So beautiful, can I say, to see you opening the Word of God. It's becoming the exception these days. So to see you, have your Bible, open your Bible, mark your Bible, write in your Bible, is such a blessing. I was sharing with a young man recently that um, was in a backslidden state, and I was sharing with him, he wasn't in around this area, so I was telling him how important it is to get plugged into a good Bible teaching church. One that, and I, and I found myself having described to him, like, what, what does that look like anymore? A, a good Bible teaching church. So this is how I described it to him. One that people bring their Bible, you bring your Bible, the pastor has a Bible, he opens the Bible, people open the Bible, and they write in it. You know, it's just like I, I really found myself having to uh, explain what that means anymore because I do find that it is the exception. It used to be the norm. And now we are becoming the exception. But oh my goodness, what a blessing, right? To open the word of God, to see the words on the page, to write, to highlight, to allow the words to go from here to here to here. And just for us to allow them to resonate, to regurgitate, to to mull them over throughout the day. And ladies, I feel like a broken record, but I'm going to tell you once again that the best thing you can do for your walk with Jesus, if you want to be immovable on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, you want to be able to say no to temptation, you want to be able to go forward in your walk, the very best thing that you can do for yourself and for your walk every single day is be in the Word of God. Be in the Word of God. (laughs) It's so important. And that's why it's so hard to do it. Because the devil knows it is the one thing The one thing that will keep you immovable, that will place you on the solid rock. And it's good to come to church, obviously. We need to. We we have to be together. And it's amazing to pray, but this one thing will make or break your walk with the Lord. So please, I implore you, I implore you, if you have found it difficult to remain in the Word, to have a daily devotional life, or maybe it's grown stale. Switch it up a bit. Try something new. Go out or come in. I can't study out, but a lot of people like to. I can't do it, but do something. Change it up a bit. Um, Maybe stop doing the one year and try just opening the Bible and go through a book of the Bible, not the Russian roulette Bible study, not just wherever it falls. That's where I go, go through the Psalms, go through the Proverbs, go through a book of the Bible a little at a time and let it go through you. So I just had to get that out. It was really, really on my heart to be able to encourage you once again, probably because the content of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, it is, it's a make or break. And and I'm going to keep saying it. So, you know, until I, I can't say it anymore the importance of the Word of God. So, as we begin uh, chapter 11 today of the Gospel of Mark, we now enter the last week of the life of Jesus, where uh, today he will proclaim to be king, judge, and prophet. He enters Jerusalem now, is Palm Sunday. Uh, it, you know, was a couple weeks ago. But, as I told you, It's good. The timing is amazing and perfect, and you'll have two weeks to do the Bible study. Do you understand why I said that? Okay. (laughs) You would need two weeks to do the Bible study. So if you waited until the last minute, that's okay. No condemnation, uh, but we are so glad that you're here. However, it's important to do the study. It is so rich. It is so good. And, um, And with that, 
It takes us to Palm Sunday where we were two weeks ago, but nevertheless, the last week of the life of Jesus. At the end of this week that we find ourselves today, Jesus will be crucified. This was, of course, Passover, the busiest time of year in Jerusalem. The celebration dated all the way back to the days of Egypt when Israel was in bondage in Egypt. And there in Egypt, while they were in bondage, there was the final plague, you remember, the one that the firstborn of all uh, households would be put to death. However, God made an arrangement for those who um, killed a lamb, a lamb had to die, and they took the blood of the lamb, and they would put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost in the form of a cross, horizontal and vertical. And then the angel of the Lord would pass over that house. Thus, they get the word Passover, in which they still celebrate to this day. This, of course, is a picture of Jesus Christ what he would do for our sins. The spotless lamb of God would take away the sins of the world. And still today, they celebrate this in Jerusalem. It's estimated that in the time of Jesus, that 256,000, that is 256,000 sheep were killed during the Passover. And they didn't take a census during that time. However, uh, counting the people, they would, during the Passover, since everybody in the world would come to Jerusalem to celebrate this, they would count the sheep. So each sheep would account for about 10 people. Thus, the amount of people estimated in the time of Jesus were two and a half million people that would attend the Passover in Jesus' days. Thousands of devout Jews from all over the world would arrive in the holy city of Jerusalem where their hearts would be filled with excitement. It was a celebration. The population of the city of Jerusalem would more than triple during Passover. And then, of course, that would mean that there would be more military, Roman military, thus they could potentially have a riot or something occur. The city was bustling with activity. It was extremely crowded. And this is where we pick up in verse 1 of Mark chapter 11. With Jesus making his pilgrimage now back to Jerusalem for the Passover, uh, verse 1 says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he set two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it to me. And if anyone says to you, Where, what are you doing with this, or why are you doing this, so say that the Lord has need of it, and immediately they will send it. As they approached the city, uh, Jesus sent two of them, it's believed it was Peter and John, uh, to go fetch a colt, that's a baby donkey, that no one has ever sat on before. So Jesus said, and if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Just say that the Lord has need of it and they'll, they'll let you have it. So I imagine that would be um, concerning to these disciples. That's why Jesus had to reassure them. In case they do say this, then you say this and they will do this. But Jesus was getting ready to do something that he had never allowed in his entire three-year ministry, and that was he was getting ready to allow the public to proclaim him as king. You recall many times in the book of Mark so far, Jesus would do a miracle, and then he would say what? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Well, now it was time to tell people. He was going to allow his followers to publicly give a, a demonstration of their um, love for him, but as their proclamation that he was king. In those days, riding a donkey is different than we think riding a donkey. We would think ride a stallion if you're a king. But in those days, a king would come into the city, enter the city on a donkey, and it would be honoring. It, it's a sign and a symbol of victory. And... Um, and 
an honor that a king would ride on a donkey. You recall in Zechariah 9, verse 9, that this moment was prophesied long ago, saying, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, our king is coming to you. He is just having salvation, lowly riding on a donkey. And then even more specifically, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Mark's gospel doesn't quote this verse because he was writing primarily to who? Do you remember? Gentiles, not Jews. We see several significant things in the first passage that we read. First, regarding a donkey, God chose the donkey, I do believe, from the foundation of the earth uh, to be the creature that Jesus, his son, would ride on. Of course, as I said, the donkey in those days would signify uh, victory, honor, and peace as a king would ride in, royalty. And remember, if you recall, in the book of Esther, Haman was the one that suggested to the king when he asked, well, what, do, what should I do for a man that I desire to honor, right? And then Haman, wicked Haman, said, ha, you know, parade him around, put, it, put the king's robe on him and uh, set him on a donkey and parade him around the city and have everybody basically worship him. Well, Jesus would ride in on a donkey deliberately declaring himself to be Israel's king and Messiah. This, of course, would incite uh, rage in the religious leaders and would set in motion the plot to kill Jesus. Not only do we see that the donkey was a very um, important animal, for Jesus to use a specific animal. Second, we see that the donkey was borrowed. We know that Jesus didn't own anything except for the clothes on his back and the sandals that he wore, right? Jesus borrowed a donkey. And uh, he was born in a borrowed manger. He taught from a borrowed boat. He ate his last meal in a borrowed room. And of course, we know that he was buried in a borrowed grave. And thirdly, we can't help but take a look at the physical feature of a donkey. I have an image for you. The markings of a donkey and wonder if God purposely created the donkey for Jesus. What do you see on the donkey's back? Right. Isn't that amazing? I looked it up because I wondered, is... Only this kind of a donkey have a cross on it, but almost every single donkey or all donkeys have the cross. Some you can see more readily. If they're a lighter color, it might be more difficult to see, but all donkeys have this significant cross on their back. Is this a coincidence that Jesus rode on a donkey? This donkey has a cross on his back. The only animal in the world that carries the mark of a cross on its back is a donkey. I don't think so. I do believe it is symbolic and divinely ordained by God from the beginning of time. God knew from the beginning and marked this animal significantly, specifically, I should say, for um, this particular time. The donkey bore the savior of the world on his back and still bears the marks today. But regarding those who went to retrieve this donkey, I can't help but wonder how concerned they were because, as I said before, the fact that Jesus had to reassure them lets us know that they were uncertain. Like, is this really going to happen? Let's bring it real time 2024. The equivalent of what Jesus asked these men to do would be like me telling you, all right, I have need of um, a certain type of a car. I want you to go down to the dealership. I want you to go grab behind the counter, grab the keys and go get in the car and drive it to me. I mean, it would be like the equivalent. Like this is, this, this was people's modes of transportation. These were people's cars, donkeys. So, I mean, it just, it's unfathomable to really think when you stop and go, wow, that, that was a pretty big uh, task to ask of them to do. Nevertheless, even though it didn't make sense to them, they still did this. 
And this ministered to me that sometimes the Lord calls us to do things that don't make sense to us, but make complete sense to him. I think the lesson for us is even when it doesn't make sense, even when we don't understand, we still have to obey God, knowing that he knows better than we do. Continuing on, verse 4. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood by did exactly what Jesus said. They asked, what are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them as Jesus had commanded them. So they let the colt go. They let the car go. All right, take the car, basically. Not only did Zechariah prophesy uh, of this, Um, coming event where Jesus would ride in on the donkey, but Daniel did as well. If you went with uh, through the book of Daniel two years ago with us, we studied this uh, in great detail, but for those who did not, I will share with you that 500 years before the time of Christ, Daniel wrote this prophecy in Daniel 9, 24. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. So the angel of the Lord appears to Daniel and says that when the command was given to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, the Messiah would show up from that point, you could count, he would show up in seven weeks and 62 weeks. What does that mean? When we determine what a week is, It makes it very easy to understand. A week here represents one seven-year period of time. So one week equals seven years. But the angel said that there was going to be 69 weeks or 69 seven-year periods of time that will pass before the command was given or between when the command was given and when Jesus would come riding on a donkey. So if we do the math, 69, meaning 69 seven-year periods of time, 69 times seven is 483 years or 173,383, when, let me say this again, 173,880 days after, from, from when the command was given, to restore and rebuild in Nehemiah 2, count 173,880 days. And from that point, that should be the day that Jesus rode in on a donkey. Was it? Well, let's look. The command was given in Nehemiah chapter 2. We're told the month of Nisan, Nisan in uh, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. That date was March 28th. 445 BC, when the command was given, March 28th, 445 BC. If we then count, according to Daniel's prophecy, 69 seven-year periods of time, or 483 years, or 173,880 days, that takes us to... April 6, 32 AD, the day, the very day that Jesus rode in on a donkey. Amazing, isn't it? The word of God is true. His promises are true. How could this prophecy have been spoken 500 years before the time of Christ and fulfilled? The only answer is God. The only answer is God. This tells us something important. God is never late. And it tells us God is never early. What it tells us is God is always on time, not a moment early, not a moment late. He is always faithful to his promises. Has God promised you something? 
I mean, he's promised us a lot, but just personally. Know that God will bring that to pass in his timing. I do believe the problem is that we grow impatient, waiting for the promise. So then we may take things into our hands, try to do things to speed up the process. And then it ends up not being God's timing when we take matters into our own hands. I pray today that this encourages you. The perfect timing of God. Holding everything in his hands. He holds time, space, to the very last moment in his hands. So if you're waiting for something this morning, know that God, he's got your number. He knows the day and he will fulfill it in his timing. Moving on, verse seven. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it and he sat on it and many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. As Jesus gets on the donkey, to ride the disciples, or to ride the donkey. The disciples then throw some of their outer garments on the donkey. So Jesus, maybe like a saddle, so Jesus could lay on it or sit on it. And then other people began to lay their garments on the road, sort of creating a path. This gesture of laying down one's garment is symbolic of surrender. It's symbolic of submission, submission to their king. We may not have clothes that we lay down before our king, King Jesus, but there are certainly other things that we can lay down before him. Perhaps it's your plan, your agenda, your timing on something, your agenda, a uh, schedule, your rights in exchange for his. What is it maybe that the Lord is asking you to lay down? We're going to get talk about forgiveness um, a bit later, but there are things as we go through this study that I want you just to be quietly asking the Lord, is that it? Is that it? Maybe asking the Spirit to open your understanding, that you may be open to what he is speaking to you even now, that we can take things back up that we have once laid down. Have you surrendered all to him? Have you submitted all to him? This act of laying something down, think about it. When we lay things down for Christ, it means Okay, like I'm, I'm submitting to you. Like you know better. Your timing's better. You know better. So I'm going to lay that. Whatever that is in your life, um, we must know that Jesus knows better than we do. His timing is perfect. Ours is not. So perhaps the Lord is calling you to surrender something to him today because he wants all of us, not part of us. He wants... 100%, not 99.9. .9. He wants it all. I can tell you from experience that no one or nothing is worth getting in the way of King Jesus. No one. And a good way to tell if anything is in the way, any perhaps priorities or out of alignment, is to simply ask yourself, a few questions. How did you start your day today? How do you, how will you spend your day today? And how will you end your day today? It's pretty easy. Then we can tell, I mean, you're here, so praise God, this is a good priority for you. <laughs> but perhaps let's say yesterday, that's not fair to say today. Let's say yesterday, how did you start your day? How did you go through your day? How did you end your day? Was the Lord in there? Did you carry him with you? Did you try to leave him at home when you went and did whatever? Did you know that we can't leave Jesus behind? Like he comes with us wherever we go. Even when we're sinning, he's there. Because Jesus lives inside of us, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We can't separate him from us. We can try, 
but we can't. If you were here on Wednesday night, John was talking about Elijah when he was running, and he was running and running and running, and then he hid in a cave, and, um, you know, thinking that he, I guess, could outrun God, get away from his trial, and yet who was there in the cave? God. You know, like, we, he's there. Like, we think we can get away, but we cannot. We bring him with us wherever we go. Well, continuing on. Not only were the people spreading their garments, uh, but they were began to uh, wave palm branches and shout in celebration. Verse 9 says, Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, waving the palm branches, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The people were shouting Hosanna, meaning save now. And quoting from Psalm 118, a messianic verse recognizing Jesus as the seed of David and the fulfillment of this promise to them in Psalm 118. But the problem was that they were looking for an earthly king. They were looking for a conquering king. They were looking for somebody to come and lift this oppression from them. The people were excited about Jesus. They were caught up in the moment. They were waving the branches, excited that finally somebody was going to come and take this burden of oppression from us. Yet they did not understand the real purpose why Jesus came. Jesus came to die that he might save all from hell. That's why he came. He came on a heavenly rescue mission, not to establish an earthly kingdom, but to establish a heavenly kingdom. I do believe that there are some like this today. And perhaps all of us can say, yes, we have gotten caught up in this. I, I can see myself in these followers of Jesus that didn't quite understand who he was and what his mission was, but they were excited. They were caught up in the moment. They were caught up in the movement, let's say. They were caught up in the motivation, and yet they missed the point. They miss the most important point. They miss the whole message of the cross. Just went right over their head. Because they were focused on the here and now. Have you ever been like that? Perhaps maybe early in your walk with the Lord, or some of you might even be new Christians. And, you know, we just focus on the here and now and what God's doing, which is great. But um, we can get really excited about something, very passionate about something, and we can miss the whole point. We can miss the cross. We can miss, can I say, the pain, the suffering, because the cross is an instrument of death. We can forget the point that Jesus said that we are to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, the cross, the pain, the death, the sorrow, the suffering, and follow him. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. That means you say no to you. You say no to your flesh. You say no to your former passions and lust and desire. No, we say no more. That was the old woman. I'm not bringing her in to this relationship with Jesus. That was the old me. We say no. And then we take up, it says, his cross, not our cross, his cross, his cross, the one that he bore with the blood and the stripes and the pain and the suffering. And we follow him. We follow Jesus. And if we want to be women who follow in his dust, follow closely, so close that we're in his dust, it will be painful and hard. Did anybody ever tell you that the Christian life would be easy? Come to Jesus. It's the easy road. Anyone? Okay, okay, that's what I thought. No, it's the more difficult road. It's the narrow road. It's the harder one. What's the alternative, though? I mean, do you really want to go back to the old life? Do we really want it that? No. If it would be easy to walk with Jesus, everybody would, right? It's not. It is a choice that we must make. 
The cross, as I said, is an instrument of death. It is not the road of ease. No one said that it would be easy to follow Jesus. Matthew 7, 13 says, enter by the wide gate. Oh, I ca- you're awake. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are few that go, how many? Many. There's a lot. There's a lot that are on the wide road because narrow is the gate and easy is the way. No, what, is it, what does it say? Difficult. What? Difficult. Difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are how many? Few that find it. It's not easy ladies, to walk with Jesus. It's not easy to stay on the straight and the narrow path. It is much easier to walk on the broad road. But that road leads to death and destruction and pain and sorrow and suffering. Any of us who have come out of the world, let's see, anybody come out of the world? Okay, okay, hello. We know that right there is, that's the hard, that's That's the harder way. The wider road is the harder way. Because of the pain that it brings. The narrow road, it brings peace. It brings patience. It brings the fruit of the Spirit. But it's not the easy way to take. Here in Mark 11, we see that there's four types of people. I'm going to run through them quickly. Those that are surrendered to Jesus, they're the ones that are waving the palm branches and, um, well, probably they might have been the ones laying their clothes down. They're surrendered to Jesus or submitted to him, doing that act. Um, And then we also had those in this Palm Sunday road that were very excited about Jesus, shouting to him, yes, you know, their relationship with the Lord is an inch deep, you know, it's just, it's not very deep. They jump high, but then they kind of just, you know, they just land um, hard. And then those that were also just spectators, standing around, just watching, observing. We have these in the church as well. And though, we also have those that scoffed him. John's gospel tells us at this moment that the Pharisees were greatly displeased. John 12, 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They saw the excitement, the um, adoration that that Jesus brought with all of these people around. Verse 11, and Jesus went from that point off the donkey into Jerusalem, or he's in Jerusalem now, from got off the donkey and went into the temple. So when he had looked around at all the things, or all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. I know I've read this before many times, but this time it got me good. It just like popped off the page, and I will say it was probably one of the main things that ministered to me in this chapter. And you're like, well, what was it? He got off, he went in, and he went home. You know, what was it? We see here that Jesus will come back the next day and cleanse the temple. But he went and he saw everything. He saw it. He saw the money changers. He saw what was going on. And yet he didn't do anything. Well, that struck me odd. Why did he go and leave? He would have seen, as he looked around, the money changers. He would have seen the doves being sold. Yet he walked away and returned to Bethany knowing that it wasn't the right time. He could have taken care of matters right then. Boom, done, quick, overturn it, let's go. It wasn't time. Jesus removed himself from the situation, I believe, to take time to pray, to consider 
how he should respond in this situation. I mean, this is the second time now. This has already happened the first time. And here we are back again. I do believe this is a good lesson for us. When we're faced with a difficult decision, hard things, grieving, let's say, situations, something that has displeased you or you know is displeasing to Jesus, how do you react? Do you blow up? Do you become angry? Do you go off on somebody? Do you like vent? Or do you walk away? Let yourself cool off a little bit. Take time to pray. Consider how you might respond correctly in a godly way. Do you answer hastily and end up saying or doing things that could have been avoided if you would have waited just a day? Proverbs 15, 28 says, The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. Wow. Studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. I wonder today if any of you are perhaps faced with a situation, even today, where you need a day to cool off. You need some time to pray and consider how to respond, to answer. I do believe that it is wise, as Proverbs said, to study how to answer. Verse 12, now the next day when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. As Jesus is making now his way uh, back to Jerusalem the next day. So he left. This is day two. He's coming back. He will now enter to cleanse the temple for the second time. But Mark just tells us, oh, he's hungry. So he's hungry. And this could have been left out of the Gospels, but it's important that it's in the Gospels. What does this mean? Well, fig trees were common in this area. They produce leaves from March or April, um, and then they start to bear fruit a couple months later, around June. They also have a harvest in August and in December. The fact that there were leaves on this tree, we don't know how large or small the tree was, but the fact that there were leaves on it tells us or reveals to us that there should have been something happening, whether it was small fruit, green fruit, something. It might have not been ripe for another month because let's think about it. This was April. And if it was, let's say, March that the fig tree started producing leaves, it should have something, something. It may not have been ripe fruit quite yet, but there should have been something small, something green, something on this tree to indicate that it was going to bear fruit. The point is that there should have been something, but there was nothing. That this tree had the appearance that there was fruit on it because it was green and lush and had a lot of leaves, but there wasn't any fruit on it. Jesus was giving a practical illustration for his disciples. Israel was the fig tree. And in fact, Israel is spoken of many times in scripture as a fig tree. In Jeremiah, Amos, Ezekiel, and Hosea all speak of Israel as being a fig tree. And like the fig tree, Israel had the appearance of life seen within its religious practices, its temples, its traditions, it, the Torah, the scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees, etc. Yet, in reality, there was no real fruit. It had the appearance on the outside, but inside, there was no fruit. And the fig tree withering was a picture of what had happened to Israel in its present fruitlessness. 
although they had years, years to grow, years to have fruit. Jesus was there for three years with them. They did not bear fruit to God. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. We are not to go around as believers and be judgy. We are not to judge others. Only God can judge a person's heart. He is the only one. However, Jesus instructs us here that we can know genuine Christians by the fruit in their life. We are to be fruit inspectors, and that's okay. Not judgers, but inspectors. What are we to in inspect? We are to inspect, I would say you'd have to see if a fruit, a tree has fruit on it. You'd have to kind of get in there and look, right? So I would say inspect closely. It's not like we're to walk by a tree and it's got leaves on it and, and it would, oh yeah, I'm sure because it's lush, I'm sure it has some fruit. Not everything that's pretty on the outside is fruitful on the inside, right? The tree had a name that it was alive, but it was dead. And I thought, this is how we can be at times. There is, you know, a display of attractiveness. We have our um, Christianese. We can say the right words. We can pray the right prayers. But only God knows what's going on inside of our hearts. And then for others, there may be a lot of activity. It looks like, wow, you serve the Lord. You're serving the Lord. Lots of activity, very busy, or a lot of passion but not a lot of fruit. I'm talking about Christians here. Like we can be these people. They had leaves enough for themselves, but there was nothing left for the Lord. Jesus didn't say, by their leaves, you will know them, did he? He said, by their fruits, you will know them, plural. You will know them. Not one, many. The Lord said to the fig tree, in essence, because you can't bear fruit for me, you will be no, able to bear no fruit for anyone else. So he cursed the tree. There was no fruit for Jesus. And if there was no fruit for Jesus, there would be no fruit for anyone else. You know, we can try to manufacture our own fruit, can't we? We can try. I remember as being a new believer, like really wanting to manufacture fruit, trying really, really, really hard. I'm just going to try harder not to sin. I'm just going to try harder to be nice. I'm going to try harder to hold my tongue. You can't. It's not possible. Because fruit, the fruit of the Spirit that Galatians talks about, can only come from Jesus, only come from the Holy Spirit, and it comes as we abide in Christ, then we bear much fruit. Galatians 5.22 lists the nine fruits of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is singular. The fruit of the Spirit is love. As a believer, the first fruit in your life should be that you love God and that you love others. And from that fruit bears the others. From love, my love of God and my love for others, then joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And yes, it is there on the end. Self-control, it's there. The book ends, love and self-control. Continuing on in Galatians 5, it says, against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have, here it is again, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's the key. Say no to me, death to me, fruit will, will be born. If I say no to me, deny myself, crucify my flesh. And then it says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. 
That's the second part. Die, death, crucify me so that I may walk with him and live with him and bear much fruit in our lives. That's it right there. Death, crucifixion to Michelle, the old woman. And then I live in the spirit and walk in the spirit, abiding in Christ. And when we do that, we bear much fruit. Because the key is to abide, which means to live, dwell, remain. John 15, 4 says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot, it is not possible, to bear fruit of itself. That's where we find this tree. You just can't. Unless it abides in the vine, in Jesus, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That's the key right there. Are you living with Jesus? Are you dwelling with him? Are you remaining with him? Are you continuing with him? Are you in the word in the morning? Do you, do you think about it throughout the day? Do you take it with you? Do you have a, you know, a Bible with you? Like, so that out when you're, let's say, I don't know, wherever you're at, the kids are somewhere and you can pop your Bible open and you can do your Bible study or you can read or you, there's so much available to us that we have no excuse not to walk with Jesus. Much more than it used to be, right? I mean, you've got podcasts and you've got, I mean, like Pastor John gives you a daily devotional. It comes to your phone, for goodness sakes, every single day. <laughs> I'm like, we have no excuse not to walk closely with Jesus. The key to bearing fruit is abiding in Christ living with him, dwelling with him, hanging in there with him, hanging out with him. Okay, Jesus, let's go hang out. You know, consuming him all day long and obeying the word of God. Let's move on. Verse 15. So they came to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the many changers and the seats of those who sold doves. That's significant, underlying that. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares throughout the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, it is not written, my house, is it not written, excuse me, that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Here is a picture of Jesus that we don't often see in scripture. And this is now the second time that he has cleansed the temple, once at the beginning of his ministry, and now once at the end of his ministry a few years later, Jesus was filled with righteous indignation. Lest anybody say Jesus went in there, was fully out of control and ranting and raving. I had someone say that to me one time who um, was out of control in a situation. Well, Jesus, you know, standing for what they thought was righteousness, but it was not controlled. It was out of control. And Jesus was meek. Meekness is strength under control. So if we can't control ourselves when we're standing up for something, we better just sit back and be quiet. Because we must remember that meekness is strength under control. Although Jesus was filled with this righteous indignation, he was meek at the same time. He was self-controlled. It was completely controlled, not out of control. And the reason why he did this is because people had come into the church and they were buying and selling and taking advantage of the people. Not only did those in the temple take advantage of the people, but they took advantage of the poor. And that's even worse. Mark specifically mentions that the merchant sold doves. That's why I had you underline it, that the merchant sold doves. The dove was one of the few sacrifices that poor people could afford to come and sacrifice. It was actually the sacrifice that Joseph and Mary brought when they dedicated Jesus. The priesthood was so political at this time that you could literally buy a position in the priesthood. Historians tell us that Annas, the power behind the priesthood, who oversaw the business of the temple, was 
was the one that was basically in charge in, in spearheading this entire thing. The phrase, a den of thieves, is a place where, I mean, it's exactly what it says. It's a place where thieves would go to hide in a den or a cave. They would run to hide in a cave. In using this term, Jesus was basically saying to the chief priests and scribes that they were using the church, the temple, as its, and its religious services as a cover-up to cover up, to hide their sin and hypocrisy. And Jesus was not only upset about this, um, that the people were being taken advantage of and the poor, but that in addition to that, that they changed the whole purpose of the church. That was not the purpose. The purpose was to come in, that, that the temple, that God's house was to be a house of prayer, not a house of um, exchanging money and people being taken advantage of wickedness. The purpose was to worship God. But they got so caught up in the money that they forgot the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to bring him glory and to make disciples. The purpose of the church is really threefold. The purpose of the church, if you're taking notes, is to reach up, meaning to look up to the Lord, to worship him, to glorify him, to praise him. The purpose of the church is also to reach in, to encourage, build up, to minister to, to teach the body of Christ, teaching and tending the body of Christ like Jesus told Peter. And then finally, the purpose of the church is to reach out, to share the gospel to the lost. However, it's only when we reach up and in that we are able then to reach out and do that effectively. And unfortunately, we're seeing a shift in the church. It's more like amazing praise, amazing worship, little word, you know, amazing outreaches, outreach, let's go do this, very little word. We're seeing a lot of the up and a lot of the out, that very little in reach. And I do believe that this is the great problem of the church. Very little teaching of the word of God and tending to the people of God. A lot of activity, very little word of God. Well, just like the temple needed to be cleansed a second time, we as believers can grow dirty. And I found it very interesting that Jesus cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry and at the end. And I thought about myself. I thought about when I first got saved, and you may understand this as well. It may be your story. But when I first got saved, I cleaned a house. My parents had a Ouija board. I threw it in the fire. I mean, I burned that baby. And anything like any... We, didn't, we had VHS tapes back then when I got saved. So anything that was wicked and unrighteous, I got rid of it. I didn't throw it in the trash because I didn't want somebody else to come upon it. So I burned it in the fire. Specifically remember that. Did not want any of that temptation around me. So I got rid of it. Like, no way. That's the old life. I don't even want to be tempted by it. I cleaned house. I got rid of that. I overturned those things in my life. However, I was thinking about it yesterday, how important it is to keep those tables overturned, to keep our temple clean, because the temple is who? Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? In us. We are the temple. He lives in us. So how much more important it is for us to go in and overturn the things that we may have grabbed onto perhaps later in life. At the beginning of our life, our walk with Jesus, and now some of us getting towards the end of our walk with Jesus, how much more important that we don't honestly ask Jesus, is there anything that I have allowed back in that needs to go? When we first got saved, we were no way, Jose, no way, no, no, no. But perhaps we've allowed some of that back in. I mean, Jesus did do this once before. And it had only been a couple years. And then he went back and did it again. As the Lord looks at our temple, 
the temple that he chose to dwell in, us. There may be some tables that need to be overturned, that we have set up in our own lives, things that we've allowed back into our life with Jesus. And he, as the head of our house, is wanting to do some heavenly house cleaning today. Would you let him? Would you allow him to do what he has desired to do in your life? Verse 18. And the scribes and chief priests heard, and they sought how they might destroy him. Now they're really upset. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from its roots. And Peter, remembering what Jesus had said, said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now, moving on, because we're short on time, and this is, there's a lot in this study, I want to jump right into verse 22. Jesus gives a little short Bible study to those disciples on faith and forgiveness, two things that will always stand in the way of our prayers from being answered. That is a lack of faith, and that is unforgiveness. Verse 22, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will. For those of you who are doubting today, underline will and will. Have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, Believe that you receive them and you, here's another will, underline it, will have them. This doesn't mean that Jesus is our genie. Like, okay, G Jesus, I want this, this, and this, this house, this car, this, whatever, whatever it is. However, we are to ask big things of God. I do believe However, the bigger we ask, the bigger the trust that is required. The bigger the mountain, the bigger the trust. When we ask big things of God, we then are required to trust bigger. You got an unsaved spouse? That's, that's a mountain. That's big. Are you praying and believing that God will, will, will do it for you? Then you're going to have to trust big. You have a prodigal? That God has told you because he has promised in scripture that they will come back, but you're doubting? Doubt stands in the way of our prayers being answered. We can rest assured knowing that it will come to pass in our lives because God has promised. Having a child is a prayer that God honors. It's not selfish. Getting married, that's a prayer that God honors. If God has put the desire in your heart, he's not an Indian giver. He will fulfill that. Do you believe that today? Do you? Okay. God will. So for you that are doubting, you, I'm hoping you've underlined those three wills. He will, he will, he will. He will do it. But he may be waiting to stretch your faith, to draw out your faith, to make you trust him in a way you haven't had to trust him before. But nevertheless, we can rest assured that our God said it and he will, will, will do it. He will do it. The bigger the request, the bigger the trust. If your prayer has yet to be answered, does that mean that you stop asking? Does it? 
Okay. It means that we are to then persist, I would say, even more. Because I do believe we're getting closer when we get weary. It's like that story that Pastor Chuck, and I'm going to probably botch it here because it's not in front of me, but it's a story about uh, the guy who owned, um, he was mining for gold and he went and he, he sold everything he had and he bought all this machinery and he was mining, 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 and he just never struck gold. So he got really frustrated and he sold all of his equipment to a junkyard, a junk dealer. And somebody came across it and he bought all of that and he set it up again where this man, in the exact spot that this man was digging. And lo and behold, this was in Colorado, I believe, the man struck gold and became the richest miner in Colorado. And the geologist that was helping this man said, regarding the other man who gave up, if he would have just dug three more feet. Three more feet. He would have struck gold. That has always ministered to me. True story. He has always ministered to me because I think three more feet. One more day. Hang in there, ladies. Your answer is around the corner. Especially if you're about ready to give up. It's there. It is so close. Hang in there. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who finds, seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, if he has a son, ask for bread, or if his son asks for bread, he will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father in heaven give you good things to those who ask him? The Lord desires to give you what you ask in his timing. Keep digging. Well, Jesus concludes this chapter talking about forgiveness as the second thing. Faith is the first thing or um Doubt, I should say, that hinders your prayer, a lack of faith. But the second thing, verse 25, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. Refusing to forgive or holding on to bitterness also hinders our prayers. It could be that this is an area that, we, that is our mountain, Maybe your mountain is unforgiveness. Maybe your mountain that's in your way is not forgiving somebody. Sometimes it's hard. In fact, it's, it's never easy to forgive, especially if it's a great offense. But I do believe that the more you forgive, the more you are like Jesus. Because we're never more like Jesus than when we forgive. I like what Paul said in Romans 12, 18. If, I love it. I love this scripture. <laughs> if you don't know the scripture, jot it down. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I love it. Like, if it's physically possible, if it's, you know, if somebody has passed away, let's say, and you never forgave them, you can, you can ask God for forgiveness. He can make it right. If it's possible, if it's possible for you, and as much as it depends on you, like you need to do your part, live peaceably, meaning forgive. Some men, a few men, a few women, no, all, all women. This is hard because I believe that every single one of us has been wronged in our life or has been hurt by someone or at some time. And we can carry that throughout our life. Some people can carry unforgiveness their entire life. Unforgiveness will take you out. It kills your spiritual life. I mean, it, it, it hurts your body physically as well. 
if Jesus has forgiven you, which, has Jesus forgiven you? Okay, <laughs> he's forgiven me too. Who are we then not to forgive anyone else? All men, all women, all, everyone. Who are we if he's forgiven us? If we have a hard heart, an unforgiving heart, it calls into question if we've ever received or, I would say, appreciated the forgiveness of God. If you're somebody who is holding a grudge or holding something, it will call into question whether you really understand the reality of what Jesus did on the cross. I mean, think about it for a moment, right? I mean, isn't that true? Who are we? He died for us. Who are we then not to forgive somebody? As hard as it may be, as much as we've been hurt, we are required to do that. I think I'm going to stop right here for today. And as we close, I want to ask you, are you with eyes closed and head bowed, are you holding on to bitterness today? Is there something that, is, that the Holy Spirit put his finger on? Perhaps it's um, unforgiveness or a lack of trust. Perhaps you're doubting the Lord for his timing. Perhaps you are growing impatient. You're growing weary, waiting for the answered request. Do not grow bitter, ladies. And as our eyes are closed and our head is bowed, I would ask you this morning, if that resonated with you, any of those things, would you just raise your hand up so I can see? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, almost all of us. Thank you, God. Me too. <laughs> so how about I just pray for all of us? In the name of Jesus, I just thank you, God, for these ladies that are here. Thank you for your word, Lord. It is so powerful. It is like the scalpel that slices us open at God, but your word is also the needle and thread that stitches us back up. It heals us, God. The word, it's hard to hear, it's hard to take, but thank you for your Holy Spirit that brings to mind things, God. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that we would all, I did this last night, repent of whatever that is. Unforgiveness, bitterness, doubt, despair, discouragement, impatience, Lord, that we would repent, God, of that because we want our prayers to be answered. We don't want anything to get in the way. And Lord, would you build fervor in us? Would you build persistence in us? Would you build perseverance and endurance that we would dig in prayer three more feet, God? That we could get to the answer, that we would see it in our lifetime, God, that we would strike gold? Lord, for those that have become impatient, they become weary waiting. Strengthen them. Give them courage today to keep going and to not give up. Lord, we love you and praise you and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.